Hey everybody, welcome to Fab Fit Friday. Um, this is the Friday back from the National ASG Conference. I want to tell you just a little bit about the conference. I had such an amazing time. I got to hang out with and catch up with, you know, quite a few sewers. Hi, Diane. Welcome. We're talking about Fab Fit Friday. Um, I really, I mean, I was so excited. I got to see some of my sewing friends that I have not seen in a long time because I haven't been to an ASG conference since, since 2017, mostly because my schedule was um, conflicting with the conference and I was teaching at the Stitches event. So I was really happy this year that the conference was on a day that there wasn't a Stitches event or that weekend. So I made a bunch of new friends, I connected with my old friends, and I taught four sold out classes, which really, really, really um, went well. Um, and on the last day at lunch, I sat in the lucky chair and I actually won a dress form that was a door prize from um, Joe over at the French European Dress Form Company. And I have to tell you, you know I love my ditto form. Love, love, love. Oh, my thing says love, hold on. Oh, is that better now? Must get my microphone over here, sorry. Is that better in the volume? Let me know if the volume is better. Um, so I had a really good time. I won the dress form. I was kind of shocked that I'm a size 18, which is in their plus size, and there's only one size bigger than me. But happily, <laughs> I do fit into a size, and that's really all that matters. Um, oh, Pat says, congratulations on your win. Um, thank you. Hi, Anne. Hi, Diane. Hi, Kathy. Mary. Welcome, welcome. All right, so I taught my Happy Pants class um, at the convention, and I think one of the students was looking for my tutorial showing how to get rid of um, extra ease on the back leg, and I know I did it as a tutorial already, but I went to look for it to put a link in the group, and I couldn't find it. So part of my um, going forward plans on my YouTube channel is I'm going to try to really categorize all my videos into playlists. So I will try to get everything I've done for pants fitting in my pants fitting pl playlist, um, you know, my alterations in the alterations playlist, you know, shirt, sleeves, whatever, just to make it easier to find stuff. Because now that I have so many videos, it's getting hard to find um, what I'm looking for and I'm the owner of the channel. So I'm going to quickly show how to get rid of ease on the back leg. Then I'm going to show you a little bit of behind the scenes when I'm um, um, prepping for a class. I'm teaching my Break Your Serger Out of the Box class tonight at 6. And, you know, just because I love all you guys, I'll just share with you. My parents are having a little uh, health crisis. My dad has a, um, you know, he didn't feel well yesterday. Um, and it turns out it wasn't a stomach bug, it's a blockage he has in his intestines. So he's going to be fine, um, but he's at the hospital. So my sister and I are taking turns sleeping over with my mom. So tonight after my class at eight o'clock, I'm hopping in the car and I'm going down to relieve my sister who has been there since last night when my dad went to the hospital. So I'm a little, I wanna say, disorganized in terms of coming up with a unique project and since I want my surgery class to go really well, I thought I would show you how I set up. I'll talk about some things on the surgery which you may find helpful. And if anybody's watching this before six o'clock, there's still time to sign up. So if anybody wants to join me for the Break Your Surgery Out of the Box class, um, you can head over to Stitches Events um, and sign up for that. If you click the link under the video that is to my link tree, all my links are there, so that's my new way of connecting with you guys. So before we get going on the serger, let me just switch my view here. And what I want to do is I'm just gonna 
I am just going to draw a leg on here. Of course, I probably should have prepped that before I got on. Um, so this is just going to be... I just want to make it so you can see what I'm doing. Let me just make it a little darker. Okay, so this is just going to be a quick leg. So let's say this is our crotch curve, our waist, our leg. And let's say this is our side seam. So here is our leg. It's not a super fancy leg. I, um, I cannot get good points for drawing. Um, I suck at drawing, but it'll get the job done here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my ruler and I am going to go right up the middle and establish my grain line. I'm eyeballing it, but basically there's my vertical grain line. Okay, and then let's say on your back leg, everything's fitting fine. You don't have any weird um, wrinkles. You just have too much ease on your back leg. Technically, you could take it in and take it in you know, evenly on side and inseam. But I have found if you take the time to go in and remove the ease from where it, you're, you've got it pinned out, sometimes that works better. So this is just a quick way to get rid of ease. So first you want to establish where your ease, too much ease is. So let's say, you know, it's it starts here and it's, you know, it's, it's in this area here. What you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a diagonal line from the side seam down to where that ease starts. Now, you don't have to use the, the center vertical grain line. You could create another line. You know, if you if it's really if you're really pinning it out over here, closer to the side seam, you could draw a parallel line to your center grain line and connect it there. Um, or you can also do a diagonal line from your crotch curve to it. So if you have more than an inch to remove, what I would do, and I'll just draw this in orange so you, just so you know, you could actually have two vertical grain lines on either side and connect it to that diagonal. Okay, that way you can get rid of more than an inch. But if you have an inch or less, you can do it in the center of the leg or you can do it a little bit farther over. Really, you can kind of position this where the um, where you've pinned out your extra ease. So for this example, I'm just gonna pretend it's right here, and I've drawn my diagonal line from my side seam down to where we wanna start getting rid of the ease. So the purpose of this diagonal line is just to come from the side seam diagonally to our vertical line. Let me know if anybody has questions about that. Um, then I'm gonna also create one other line. I call this my control point. Okay, so um, I'm gonna slash now, and how I'm gonna slash is I'm gonna go up my vertical, and then I'm gonna go to my diagonal, and I'm gonna create a pivot at the side seam. I'm not gonna cut through my side seam, but I'm gonna create a pivot. Then I'm also going to create a slash at my control point here. Now the reason why you need a control point is if you're going to use this method to get rid of ease, um, doing it like this without having the control point, you can see what happens at the bottom. The leg gets all funked up down here. So this control point or this extra slash is going to allow us to create a even adjustment. So I'm going to I'm going to flip this over so it's out of the way. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to slide this top rectangle up so that it's overlapping the amount I want to get rid of. So like from here to here is about a half an inch. Let me just zoom in so you can see. Okay. So I can tape that in place. Okay, so now I've got an overlap of this fabric right here. 
So all of this is overlapped, okay? Then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring the bottom part of the leg and I'm gonna straighten it out, but I'm gonna overlap it evenly all the way down. Okay, so you can see if I swing this back and I tape it into position here now, my overlap is here. All of this has been overlapped. So you can see on this small sample, I was able to get rid of about a half an inch. So on a full size pant pattern, I probably could get rid of about an inch max at one, um, you know, at one slash. Now here's the thing. If you don't need to get rid of this ease all the way down to the hem, you can put it back here. So I can add ease back in. I can add a little bit here. And really, because I pivoted this way, I'm just adding here. Now, if I need to get rid of more and I'm gonna slash this line, let's say I repeat Pete over here and I get rid of some more, I can also add back over here if I need to. So if I start you know, getting rid of more than just this half inch over here, and I wanna slash this as well and repeat it over here to get rid of more, you know, you can add back at the hem if you need to. So that's just a quick tutorial showing how to remove ease on the back leg. And I'll make sure that I post this link to this video um, under the question someone had that they wanted to see this tutorial. So that takes care of that little issue. Now I just wanna show you um, how I prep for a, a serger class. And the first thing I'm going to do is prep my materials. So I always like to have my instruction manual for the serger I'm using for the class handy, including the um, quick reference chart. That's important because, um, you know, if you're having trouble in class, or if I'm having trouble in class, or if I don't remember a step, I have it right here in front of me. So if you're saying to yourself, oh, I'm gonna take a serger class um, and I'm gonna learn how to do all these stitches, just remember that making notes in your instruction book when you're working on a certain topic um, might help you the next time you need to use that stitch. So I keep this handy and I recommend students keep it handy as well to refer to, to make notes um, so that when they learn different techniques, they can, you know, give themselves little notes and helping hints for um, doing that in the future after the class is over. So I've got that all set up and ready to go. Then I do a um, general, what do I want to say, like a general um, tips and um, supplies. So I'll talk about threads, for example. Um, I like high quality threads, so I like the Madeira threads, I like the Guterman threads. Um, I'll use Maxi Lock as my base level of quality. Uh, Maxi Lock is a little bit fuzzier than Madeira, so like if I put these right next to each other, just to show you, let me zoom in and see if we can see the fuzziness. I don't know if you can see, but the maxi lock is the light blue one, and it's it's a fuzzier thread, but it still works pretty well. So I'm going to talk about you know picking out the right threads. I'm also going to talk about um, if you're working with a special garment and you need a like a funky colored thread you can actually use all-purpose thread in your serger. So it doesn't need to be a giant spool. It could be, you know, let's say you needed orange. You know, you could use a standard orange thread in your um, loopers and needles um, and not buy four cones of a color you're just going to use once. So I talk about threads. Um, then I talk about, you know, tools that are helpful. You know, having your tweezers is helpful. Um, using Wonder Clips instead of pins is really helpful because wonder clips can't hurt your blade. If you don't take out a pin, you can whack your 
displayed and you're going to be sad because you're going to have to get it fixed. You know, then I talk about things like having either um, tissue paper or tracing paper or strips of wash away stabilizer to support fabrics that are very sheer or unruly to help you get a good result. So I talk about that. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'll also talk about thread nets and how they help slippery thread from sliding down the spool as you're surging and um, getting tangled under your the bottom of your spool. So I talk about those things. I will talk about needles and I will encourage everybody in the class to look at their manual and see if they have a specific needle they have to use. Many of the older sergers will say you need to use EL705 serger needles. Um, more current, newer models actually are getting away from that and many of them use universal needles which is very cool. Um, I use stretch needles in my serger when I'm working with knits. I use a top stitch needle when I'm doing a heavier decorative thread. But you need to check it on your serger and you need to check your manual. So I talk about those things. Then after I've talked about, you know, all the different threads, needles, um, and that kind of thing, I will show some basic samples. So I like to show the difference between cutting width, if you've got your cutting width set to the widest, some of the newer sergers can give you a three quarter or three eighth inch seam, some will just give a quarter, depending. I show the difference um, that changing your stitch length does from very close together at 1.0 all the way to very far apart at 4.0. And then I have a nice sample of a variety of three thread stitches. So I have rolled hem, narrow hem, and wide hem. And I used a metallic woolly nylon to show how the woolly nylon will take up the space between the stitches. Then I have a sample that has a bunch of flat lock, reverse flat lock, and ruffling just to show some, you know, possibilities there. And then from my fashion surging technique class, I love to show this sample of my little mini top I made and how you can use the flat lock stitch to get all sorts of decorative effects. You know, so I show all these samples, and then after I've shown the um, you know, the basic samples, I start working on technique. And I like to set up the class so that we start with a four thread stitch and then we go down to a rolled hem. So we'll all practice stitching on something pretty stable. And after we're comfortable, I show how to do curves and corners. And you can see here, I have a big pile of curves and corners. So instead of wasting fabric every time, what I do here is, so let's say I have a corner sample right here that I can show the class. Okay, so then to prep for class, I am going to keep that aside. And then this, this one right here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cut off my previous class stitching and I will use this fabric to show how to do it again. So this way I'm not making, you know, multiple, um, you know, multiple samples of the same technique over and over again and wasting a lot of fabric. So basically I can use this to show my corners, inside corners and outside corners, probably a couple more times. So this sample, together with the finished sample is ready to go. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my curves and corner, I mean my curves. So on outside curves, I have a sample of using the differential feed at neutral. It's nice and smooth. And then I have one if you mistakenly put your differential feed up too high, you get this ruffling effect because it's shoving it in there faster then it needs to go. Now the interesting thing is on the inside curve sometimes it helps to um, have your differential feed 
be a little bit faster because on an inside curve, um, the outside edge, and I don't know why this is, because this outside edge is bigger than the inside edge, um, but on the inside curves, if you put your differential feet up a little bit, sometimes it makes a smoother um, finish. So I'm going to show inside and outside curves, and again, what I'm going to do is I have some good samples to show it. So here's my, my, my Easter egg sample. I'm going to show how to start and stop in the round. And then I'm going to use these previous samples for my stitching. So again, I'm just going to cut off this edge and I'm going to use it in class. Now the reason why I have an egg shape or an oval is because I can show how to go around a curve that's tight and one that's not as tight. So on the ends where the curve is really tight, it'll require a little bit more fabric management than when you're on a gentle curve on the longer sides. And then because I don't have a outside curve here, I'm going to cut this off and I'm going to So I'm going to cut that off and I'm going to make an inside curve. So I'll be able to show how to do an inside curve on this. So I've got those samples all set up and ready to go. And I'm also going to show how to finish your pants front crotch curve because that's an inside curve as well. So this is a real life example. So again, instead of cutting out a new leg, I'm going to just cut this off, and I've got a sample to show. And it's getting a little funny looking, so I think what I'm going to do is let's, let's create a new inseam so it's not as I like this. All right, so here's my new, my new front leg. So I've got that ready, and I'm just going to bring my zipper seam allowance down a little bit. So I've got my front leg to show, and then again for my back leg, I'm just going to cut this off. So those are both real life examples of inside curves, and I'm going to show how to do that. So that's all set. And I just put them together with the workbook page. So if anybody's working with a fabric that gives you a hard time, when you figure out how to get it to sew nicely on your serger, just take a piece of paper, write your notes down, take your sample, and put it in a page protector like this, and then you'll have, um, you know, you can build a reference guide for, you know, working with a variety of different fabrics, um, you know, even if you're not taking a class. If I have trouble with a certain fabric, I will make a note and stick it in a, in a folder. So there's that. That's all set. The next thing is I'm going to be working with knits. And what I like to do when I work with knits is show a variety of knits. So I have this pile of different knits. And in addition to different kinds of knits, um, I talk about how if you're going to test your fabric when you sew on knits, you want to test it in both directions. So the vertical and horizontal um, or cross grain and vertical directions. And you can see this sample is a very stretchy rib knit and the differential feed had to be N when I was going with the rib and then when I was going across the rib I had to jack it up to 2 to get the seam to lay flat. So I'll talk about different differential feed settings for knit fabrics and how it's important to test it in different directions. And then I'll just review with you some of my fabrics I have here. So this is a floral mesh. It's easy to sew, not clingy. Then I have a rib knit. This is a little bit trickier to sew because it's um, it's very stretchy and it stretches differently in both directions, um, but it's great for finishing edges and um, whatnot, but it's a two-way stretch. 
Then I have some lace knit. So I talk about how to work with that. Some sports mesh. Some crepe polyester. You know, and while I'm talking about these things, I'm going to talk about what they're good for. So crepe polyester is one of my favorite things to make tops and skirts from because it does not cling and it's very flattering to wear. It doesn't show if you're stretching it a little bit too far and it doesn't cling to your shape. So I'm a fan of a crepe knit. Then I have my little ITY knit sample. Um, again, not clingy, but it's slippery. And because it's so fine, sometimes it curls and you could have a little bit of a hard time sewing that, but it's worth the effort. Rayon Jersey, clingy, um, but nice to, you know, it's nice on, it just clings. Um, and it can be a little tricky to sew if it's stretching out of shape. Then I have the polyester fleece, French terry. Again, this is an easy one to sew. Anything that has a mechanical stretch um, is going to be easier because you're not going to have to play with your differential feed as much. Um, and it feeds in nice and easily and it doesn't curl, so it's really nice to work with. Um, another easy one to work with is double brush polyester. Super easy. Um, and usually it doesn't curl, um, but it's nice for bottom weight. Then I have some of my sports knit. Um, some sweatshirt fleece, lycra bathing suit fabric, double-faced ponte knit, very easy to, to um, sew, cotton jersey four-way stretch, and then I have this, um, this is a double-faced burnout novelty knit. And it's kind of cool. It's kind of like the fabrics I got for the crossover Cardi, but it's actually got a two-faced, you know, neon yellow and neon orange here. But, you know, I'm going to be talking about all of these fabrics, waffle knit. And then I'm going to show how to serge knits. So I will have some additional samples um, that I need to get ready for that. And what I like to do... So as I'm preparing for my class, what I like to do is just keep a running list. So I need to get some knit, knit fabric to stitch on, some stitch sample fabric. So I know I need to get that after I organize everything. So that's all set. Then I'm going to talk about um, we're going to go from that to the three thread stitches. And the first thing we're going to do with a three thread stitch is I'm going to show how to sew sheer fabrics. And I've got a page for that. Here it is. Okay, so I've got this is a silk Georgette. So I'm going to show how to work with silk Georgette. If anybody's trying to serge sheer fabrics, um, a very convenient thing to do is use a piece of clear um, wash away stabilizer because that helps support the edges. Um, I like to use a three thread narrow when I'm working with sheer knits because it shows less. And actually, even though there's no stretch um, in this direction on this sheer fabric, it's less bulky and it does have more give so it's not going to gather up your stitch. And we'll talk about actually adjusting the differential feed for sheer fabrics because with knits you go higher, with sheer fabrics you go lower on the differential feed. So I have some samples of that. And I need to get a new sheer um, knit, sheer fabric um, sample. So I'll go find another piece of something like that. So that's all set. Then I'm going to show how to do the flat lock. Oh, actually, see, this is why I prep in advance. Before we move on to the um, sheer fabrics, I'm going to show how to do a decorative edge on fleece. So you can see this is pearl crown rayon. 
you put that in the loopers front and back and actually you don't even have to do it front and back on the back side of this one I used regular thread so depending on your project if you have a right and wrong side you only need one spool of heavy decorative thread if you're making a fleece blanket you need two one for the upper looper and one for the lower looper but I'm going to talk about that and again I can show how to start and stop in the round so it looks nice and neat so that, that's the four sheer fabrics. Okay, and then we're getting into my favorite stitch territory. We are going to talk about doing... We're going to talk about the three-thread flat lock stitch. And I use the three-thread three flat lock stitch for a lot of things. The flat lock side is the side that looks like this and I slid it down um, and here's the the ladders on the wrong side so that's cool and then this one I actually like so let's say you do the flat lock and you have the ladders on one side you can also just do a three thread wide and then top stitch it down so on this side it looks like a flat felled seam but it looks like a flat lock, but that's just a three thread wide. Or you can do it as a three thread wide and have the ladders on the back. So I'll talk about those options. And then I'll talk about putting decorative thread in the needle. And you can see here, this is a metallic decorative thread. So you can get really pretty results um, using a decorative thread in your needle. and. In that case, I use a top stitch needle. So you can see here I have the top stitch needle in there ready to go um, to show people that. And then we are going to stitch a flat lock. So I need a piece, I need fabric for flat lock. Fabric for flat lock sample. So like after I get off with you guys, I'm going to cut all this extra fabric I need. All right, so that takes care of the three threads. I showed the three thread narrow on the sheer fabrics. I'll show the three thread wide, and then I'll show the flat lock. Then we're gonna work with the lettuce edge. And the lettuce edge is a technique that you can do on lightweight knit fabrics. You can see this looks kind of pretty on this lacy um, knit. You can only do this technique with fabrics that are sheer or lightweight because um, if they're too heavy they're not going to ruffle. But this is a technique that you do by adjusting your differential feed. So if you guys work with Nissan on your serger you may know that your differential feed might have to be a higher um, oh Nancy can't hear me I'm going to take my Okay, here's my fancy road mic. I'm gonna put it right here. Is this better if I have it like right in front of my face? Nancy, let me know if that helps because my, my volume is up to the max. So please let me know if that helps. I don't want anyone straining to hear. Um, this this, um, this ruffle effect is caused or created by accentuating the fact that knit fabrics stretch when you sew them. So instead of putting the differential feed on a higher number, you put it on a lower number, and what happens is the front feed dogs feed it in slower than the back feed dogs are pulling it out, and it stretches it into a ruffle. So I'm gonna show how to do that. And again, I'm gonna need um, sample fabric for, for, um, lettuce edge. Okay, so I'll find something sheer that I can show that. And then last but not least, I am going to show how to do a rolled hem. Now, a rolled hem is a great way to finish edges. And you can see here, this, roll, this rolled hem is on a sheer. And again, I left the paper or the, the wash away stabilizer partly attached so you can see how that works. Um, then I'm going to show how to do it on this tool. 
which you can't even really see the tool, but I'm going to show that you can do it on there. And then I'm going to show it on some lightweight, like cotton batiste. So I'm going to show a bunch of different, um, you know, a bunch of different ways to do the rolled hem. And at this point in class, I think we'll be almost done with the time. This is a two hour class. And of course it depends on, you know, how many students there are, how their sergers are working. So sometimes um, we'll do a little troubleshooting. So that's something that I can't predict until we get started. But those are the things I'm going to show in class. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to show you, I'm just going to make here rolled hem sample fabrics. Okay, so I've got my my uh, list here, fabrics. All right, so that's all set. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna make me big, I'm get rid of this mess, and I'm just gonna show you my serger here. So to prepare my serger, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take off the threads that I already have on there because when I teach a serger class I like to use the colors that are in the chart so um, so in my quick reference guide you can see my colors are you know green blue yellow and red basically so I am going to use blue green red and I lost my yellow so I'm going to use light blue so those are the colors I'm going to use that way I can show how to you know I can show where or you know which looper or needle is contributing to the stitch so I'm gonna plug this in and then I'm gonna just clean up my serger and get it all set up for class plug this in, it'll be light. So my serger is really, really dusty. So I like to clean it out and I like to get everything nice and organized before I start teaching. And of course, oh, this needs to be here. I have to find my scissors. Everything kind of got discombobulated when I packed for a conference. So I'm just going to cut my threads off and put those away. Um, and then I can, so I like to take a soft cloth and I have here, what do they do with my little soft cloth? So this is an old sample that I use just for testing. And the first thing I do is just wipe down the entire outside of my serger and anywhere that I can wipe to clean it off. So I'm gonna get rid of all of my threads. I'm gonna wipe all of the stuff off my serger. And if it's really messy inside, I'll go get my vacuum cleaner and I will, you know, vacuum out the inside. Oh, hi, hi, Marissa. Happy, happy Friday. Yes, I'm actually teaching all weekend. So today is really not a Friday for me because I'm teaching tonight my Break Your Surge Out of the Box class. And then tomorrow and Saturday night, I'm teaching my Crossover Cardi class. So, um, but honestly, on days I teach, I'm the happiest. All right, so I'm just going to go back here and just wipe everything down. It's good to give everything a dusting. So if you have one of these air thread, air threading sergers, I just want to point out to you, you can, um, if you need to oil, let me just zoom in here really close. See how the, the upper looper is sliding on this bar right here. So see how the bar goes up and down? 
If you want to put a dot of oil right there, if your serger is being noisy, that's fine. But you never, ever, ever, ever put oil in the air threading ports for threading your serger because these holes are just to insert your thread and wish it through to thread. So I'm just, and it says in red there, do not oil. But So I'm just pointing that out to you um, in case your serger isn't clearly marked and you have air feed, um, air feed capability. It doesn't matter which brand it is. It doesn't matter the model. You never put oil in those air feed ports. All right, so now that I've loved my machine up and I've gotten rid of most of the lint, the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to um, open my side door and you can see the mess in my side door here. See how dirty that is? So I'm just going to go in and wipe that down. And like I said, after, after I get off, I probably will take my um, handheld Dyson vacuum and I probably will go in here and just blow everything out. But you can see that you can clean a lot of stuff with a soft cloth. So use your soft cloth, get as much of it out as you can with that, and then if you need to blow it out, you can do that as well. So that's, I recommend doing this anytime you start a new major project. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take out these needles and I'm gonna put in fresh needles because if you've been working on your needles for a while, it's always good to start with fresh needles. New project, new class, new needles. So this, all this information I'm sharing with you now really comes into play, um, you know, as a sewer and being able to, I'm just gonna try to get a better angle here, hold on. like this maybe that's a little better oops um, you know so all of these things will help you you know as you're just even just surging your own projects so I'm gonna put in new needles and I have a little like secret well I don't know if it's a secret but hold on so I have, oops, I have been using in my serger my embroidery needles and the reason why I've been using those is because my embroidery needles which are designed for like industrial embroidery um, they have a stronger shaft and they have a bigger eye so because I already have these for embroidery the system is HAX 130 EB and I recommend if you want to try this you want to hand walk it put them in hand walk make sure the needles don't hit anything um, again some sergers have to have special needles or certain brands but these are organ needles and like I said they're just a little bit more reinforced and the eyes are a little bit bigger so like when I'm in class and I want to be able to thread something efficiently, um, it's easier if the eye of the needle is a little bit bigger because then I can see it to thread um, my needle a little faster if I'm trying to switch between stitches. So I'm gonna put in a set of these size 14 embroidery needles because I find that they work really well in here for me. And notice I'm giving them a tug. I want to make sure they're inserted up so I can see the tips of the ends of the needle in my window here. So see right here in this window, I can see that the needles are up all the way. Um, so I've got those installed. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to thread my serger with these colors so I can refer to the colors as I'm showing a stitch. So for example, I'm gonna put, I think we'll do green in the left needle. And I'll do 
thread and the right needle. I want to pick the two colors that show up the best for the needle threads because if I'm troubleshooting tension, I can easily see that better. So my two needles are going to be green and red. And I just get those set up like this. I'm just going to leave those there for now. I'm going to use light blue in my upper looper and I'll use dark blue in my lower looper. And really this light blue only almost comes across as white, so it's very easy to tell. Okay, so I've got my thread threading all set. And if someone in class needs help with threading, I can quickly unthread and then rethread. So I want to have it threaded before class just in case everybody's good with threading. But if someone needs help with threading, I can very easily, you know, oops, cut my threads off and show them that. So now I'm going to set my air feeder, air feeding system. I'm going to engage it by turning this lever to threading. And what that does is it snaps part of the um, air feed tube closed. I'm going to turn the hand wheel slowly towards me and it's going to snap those air feed tubes shut. So, shut. Then I can put my lower looper thread in the port, like this, and I can press the air feed, and it will thread right through here. And then I'm going to get my upper looper thread in there. Okay, so you can see it whooshed right through. Another thing I'm going to share is Okay, so one of the, the really important tools that comes with the Ovation Baby Lock Serger, and I know it comes with other brands of sergers as well, is this See this wire right here? Okay, so this is a threading wire. It has a loop on one end. See the loop? And then it's got a, you know, it's got the straight end on one side. So if I'm having trouble in class threading through the um, air feed tube, or if I have a thread that's too thick for the air feed tube, I can take this wire, insert it into the port, and I can push it all the way through and it will come out the um, eye of the looper and then I can put my heavy thread through the loop on the other end and pull it through. So this is like using a thread cradle um, but it's a wire and the one thing I want to point out about this wire is I traumatized it by trying to pull a thread that was too heavy through my ports and it coiled up like a little pigtail and I thought it was ruined. So I hung it back up on my mini dress form. I keep it in my back on my mini dress form pin there because it's so small. You, can, you can't even see it. It's so small um, and thin. So after it hung there for like a couple months, it straightened back out. So if you traumatize your little wire threader and it coils up like a pigtail because you pulled on it too hard, just hang it up somewhere. It will relax and then it will work again. So that's an important tip. And I'm just going to put this right, I'm going to sort of stick this on my computer stand so I can find it when I need it in class. So I've got that all set up. So I've threaded my loopers. I'm going to take the, um, open the tubes so I can move my needles again. I'm going to put my presser foot down and then I'm going to put my knife down. See how my knife is kind of in the way here? Okay, so the knife is in the way, and I'm going to talk about this in class as well. If you have trouble threading your, um, your needles because you have stuff in the way, if you put your knife down, so I'm just going to lock that down, and then if you take the presser foot off, you have a lot more room to thread your needles. Okay, so now... I can put my um, left needle thread as green, so I'm going to put that 
in the thread guide first. And I'm going to stick it over here. And then I'm going to get my red thread and I'm going to put that in second. And then I can thread my needles. But you can see that it's much easier to get in there when you don't have the knife up and when you don't have the presser foot on. I don't know that I need to take off the presser foot every time, but um, if you have trouble getting your needles threaded, that does help because it gives you more room. All right, so now I've got my serger all set up. And you can see, I had no trouble threading these holes in these needles because like I said, the eye of these needles are a little bit um, bigger than a standard needle. Then I'm gonna put my presser foot back on like this. And I'm gonna bring my threads over. All right, so now my serger is all ready to go. I always like to chain off just to make sure everything is stitching properly. And then here's an important thing to do. If you have a serger, and I guess it doesn't even matter if it's a baby lock, um, you want to think about what is the stitch I'm going to be sewing. So you might have sewn a project, put your serger on the shelf or back where it goes or it stays where it stays, but you haven't looked at it for a few weeks. Now you're starting a new project. You want to make sure all your settings are agreeing with what you are going to be stitching. So I want to make sure my serger is set up for a four thread stitch. So when I start teaching class and I show the four thread stitch, it's not doing something funky because I'm going to do some troubleshooting. So I don't want it to have trouble just because I don't have it set up properly right out of the gate. So I'm going to make sure my knife is set at 7.5. I'm going to make sure I put my um, knife back up too. And if I take a, a stitch here, you can see I put my knife, my knife is back up now. I'm going to put my stitch length at between two and a half and three. And I'm going to make sure my stitch selection dial is on A for four thread. So now I've got my serger all set up and ready to go. I've got all of my handout ready to go. I've got, um, well, I'm going to have to collect a few sample fabrics so I can show how to do techniques. But for the most part, my class is now ready to start. So I've got it all set up. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And honestly, part of the reason why I'm sharing this with you today is because, like I said, I'm a little bit discombobulated because of my parents. So I appreciate you joining me for this um, little behind the scenes and then for me it was hitting two birds with one stone I got to see you guys today because I miss you because I wasn't here last week and I set up for my class so thank you for letting me do that um, please if anybody has any specific uh, questions using their serger please feel free to post those below this video and you may see it as an upcoming topic for uh, you know an upcoming video because I love doing subscriber Q&A and you know I love answering questions so if you have a serger question please feel free to post those and you may see it as an upcoming topic on a Fit Tip Tuesday or another day um, sometimes I do videos on Sunday I'm gonna really try to get back to three videos a week um, once I straighten out what's going on with everything here but anyway that's my FabFit Friday for this week. I really appreciate you joining me. Um, I do want to mention I am teaching my first self-hosted class. It's going to be my easy pull-on knit pants. And let me just show you the pattern here. Okay, so this is what the pattern looks like. Well, the cover, anyway. And I'm going to show you how to um, pick a size and we're going to do some fitting in the first class and then if you need help between the first class and second class you can sign up for a private um, fitting with me during the week between the 17th which is it's a Sunday from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time and then if you need to do a fitting with me we can do that during the week and then the next Sunday on the 24th I will share how to sew the pants there's a really nice inseam pocket 
and um, I think what I'm going to do is I don't know if you guys have heard about this uh, Ruth such and such did this new technique for fitting pants the top down center out method I think doing knit pants is the perfect opportunity to test that theory so when you sew your knit pants you actually we're going to sew two legs and then sew the crotch separately so before we sew the crotch seam we are going to try on one leg and I want to try to play with um, how that works so if you're watching me and you're taking this class um, make sure you wear like leggings or something that you could have on and then slide your knit pant leg over that um, I'm gonna play with a method for creating a basted elastic casing for half a leg and I'm just gonna see if that helps um, fit the pant and we can make adjustments based on how one leg fits before we cut out and sew the second leg. So I'm going to try that along with all my other fitting techniques to see how that works. This is going to be a small class. The maximum number of students is 10, so I will have plenty of time to um, help everybody fit their knit pants. So if anyone would like to join me, I will put a link to um, this class below the description of this video. But also, if you click the link to my link tree, it's on my link tree on my Instagram and underneath this video if you'd like to join me. There's still time to get the printed pattern, but you can also get the PDF version. So I'm very excited about that. And then if anybody wants to learn how to adjust a non-stretch pattern for stretch fabric, I am doing a lecture demo for pattern review on Wednesday this week. It's going to be from 3 to 4.30 on Zoom, and I have a whole slideshow um, prepared for that. I taught it for an ASG group and they loved it. So if anybody is interested in adjusting their pattern from non-stretch to stretch, you can join me um, in that class and I will put a link to that as well. So that's all the fun I have for today. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you for Fit Tip, well, I won't see you for Fit Tip Tuesday, but I will be posting Fit Tip Tuesday video and I will see you next week for Fab Fit Friday again. So thank you so much. I'm so happy to be home and back for Fab Fit Friday. Um, thank you for watching and have a lovely, lovely weekend.